Hello! Welcome to another exciting video here on my YouTube channel that is just growing exponentially more quickly than it has been for almost a year, in that there is actually something going on. What I want to do with this channel, if you care, is have two streams of videos. One stream is what I want to call Sunday Specials, like the last two videos even though the last video came out on a Tuesday. The other is going to be more of the history of Christianity um, from different angles, as in today's video. And you can use the five video series I made last year as a framework into which these new videos can be slotted to give them a bit of wider context. So, today, according to the calendar of the Anglican Church of Canada's 1962 Book of Common Prayer, it is the Feast of St. Bede the Venerable. See, right there. Oh, 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 sorry, that's that's the wrong page. Just a second. This is, uh, the only reason I point this out to you, that it's this specific calendar, is because everyone else seems to have celebrated Bede on a different day from us. But you can almost see it there in black and white. So, I love St. Bede. The Venerable Bede is great. When I lived in Durham, sometimes I would go to the cathedral, to the Galilee Chapel, where Bede is himself entombed, and I would just sit with the saint, and I would pray, and it was great. And what makes it interesting, however, is that if we follow that prayer book calendar that I just showed you, yesterday, May 26th, was the feast of St. Augustine of Canterbury. No, 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 not, not, not that other St. Augustine. That famous theologian was St. Augustine of Hippo. And uh, that's Hippo Regius is a city in North Africa, and he was bishop there in the late 300s into around the year 430. Not just around, he died in 430. Unless he transported himself into another dimension of existence. Anyway, and the day before the 26th of May on the 25th, so two days ago, was the Feast of St. Aldhelm. So I thought it'd be worth doing a little video about a few Anglo-Saxons. Let's take these fellows in reverse order of feasts, because if we start with the Venerable Bede, we get the context for the other guys. Bede is the great historian of early England. I first encountered him when I was into historical King Arthur stuff, um, which now I'm more into legendary King Arthur stuff, so slightly different question. Um, but that means that Bede is a big source for both St. Augustine and St. Aldhelm here today. He was a monk and priest at the joint monastery of St. Peter and St. Paul at Weirmouth and Jarrow, which is now in the suburbs of modern Newcastle. He was committed to the monastery as an oblate when he was seven years old. He grew up there as a monk, became a priest, and became a teacher of the monastic community. And here's what he has to say himself. This is the Ecclesiastical History of the English People, as translated by Judith McClure and Roger Collins. It's a very good translation with very good notes. I recommend it highly. It will be, as usual, I will have a little bibliography at the bottom of my video because I am that guy. So, we find here, second, there it is. Here's what Bede has to say about his own life. I, Bede, servant of Christ and priest of the monastery of St. Peter and St. Paul, which is at Weirmouth and Jarrow, have, with the help of God and to the best of my ability, put together this account of the history of the Church of Britain and of the English people in particular, gleaned either from ancient documents or from tradition or from my own knowledge. I was born in the territory of this monastery. When I was seven years of age, by the care of my kinsmen, I was put into the charge of the Reverend Abbot Benedict and then of Caelfrith to be educated. From then on, I have spent all my life in this monastery, applying myself entirely to the study of the scriptures. And amidst the observance of the discipline of the rule and the daily task of singing in the church, it has always been my delight to learn or to teach or to write. I'd like to pause and say I feel like Bede sometimes in terms of what I want to seek vocationally for my life, just to learn and to read and to teach, learn, teach, write. At the age of 19, I was ordained deacon, and at the age of 30, priest, both times through the ministration of the Reverend Bishop John on the direction of Abbot Caelfrith. From the time I became a priest until the 59th year of my life, I have made it my business 
for my own benefit and that of my brothers, to make brief extracts from the works of the venerable fathers on the Holy Scriptures, or to add notes of my own to clarify their sense and interpretation. And then he goes and gives a big list of all the stuff he's written, an extraordinarily large amount of which is commentaries. And as he says, his commentaries are a combination of quotations from the fathers and his own thoughts, um, which if you want to read Reed's commentaries, that is exactly what you will find. That's not the only thing he's, things he wrote. Um, he also wrote Saints' Lives. Most famously, he wrote Two Lives of St. Cuthbert, one in verse and one in prose as well as the history of the abbots of Wearmouth and Jarrow. Um, you can read these particular things in the Penguin Classics volume, The Age of Bede, which is expanded from an older version called Lives of the Saints. He also wrote books about time and its calculation, out of which has been extracted a chronicle. But is it a chronicle? Or is it computus chronographically organized? Hmm. You see the date of Easter, for which the science of computers is mostly used in the Middle Ages, is an endlessly hot topic in Christianity. Indeed, it remains unresolved to this day. So it's, uh, it's an interesting question. But that is, the, that is the reason why Bede has that. It's not because he's an actual, he's committed to um, chronographic history writing, but because he is also devoted, devoted to the reckoning of time. Anyway... Bede is most famous for this, the Ecclesiastical History of the English People. It's written in the tradition of Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, so it includes a lot of documentary evidence along with the narrative, which makes it pretty cool for that as well. You can, you can read um, St. Gregory the Great's responses to St. Augustine of Canterbury. You can read letters um, by Theodore of Tarsus, who was another um, 7th century uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. So lots of great stuff going on in Bede. He begins in the ecclesiastical history with Christianity in Britain under the Romans. Um, and then he treats of the Roman withdrawal, the Anglo-Saxon invasions, which is why those two events are sort of why he comes up in historical King Arthur discussions. But then the reintroduction of Christianity with St. Augustine at Canterbury in 597. And then it follows the history of the Anglo-Saxon church up to its own day of the various different missionary bishops, some of them coming from the south, from the continent, through Gaul, Italy. Theodore of Tarsus himself is, in fact, from Tarsus in Asia Minor, as well as coming from Ireland. Um, people like St. Aidan of Lindisfarne coming from Ireland and bringing their own customs. And so lots of good stuff here. And as a general thought on Anglo-Saxon Christianity and what the narrative of the Venerable Bede reveals, and which other texts, archaeology and art confirm, is that it is drawing strength from this dual heritage. Um, from the traditions of Irish Christianity that people like St. Aidan bring with them, as well as the continental Christianity that people like St. Augustine brought with them. And both of those traditions, they're not so far apart. You might find some crazy, I mean, some um, very level-headed but misguided people on the internet who think that Celtic Christianity is somehow wildly different from early medieval Christianity on the content continent. This is not really true. Um, but it is not the exact same thing for a whole variety of historical factors. But both traditions are, you might say, equally valid trajectories of the patristic tradition. Both of them are rooted in patristics, in the ancient fathers of the church, in the use of the Latin language, in liturgy and life of the church, in scripture. Um, but they are subtly different in a few specific questions of canon law, liturgy, and monastic custom, which are the reason why they're... Those are the actual reasons why there's lots of friction, not because, besides perhaps... Perhaps, perhaps we could say that those who come from the continent where there are always tendencies within the Roman church to attempt to um, centralize things. So people who come from the continent come with some of those ideals and they want to centralize things with Canterbury and make Canterbury the same as what's going on in Rome. And you can see how this might cause problems for people who are less interested in that. But um, there are great things coming from both the Irish and perhaps Welsh um, traditions of Christianity and from the more continental tradition um, with the stronger ties to Rome. And indeed, the Anglo-Saxons end up really loving Roman um, Christianity and Roman culture, and so they love the rule of St. Benedict that is loved by Pope St. Gregory the Great, and they love 
um, they use Roman liturgy and Roman canon law, and then when they become missionaries to places in Germania, they bring with them Roman canon law, Roman liturgy, and Benedictine monasticism, and those become the heart of what eventually is the Carolingian Empire and its own um, reform movement that is also closely tied with Rome. But they also adopt Roman singing, but Roman singing itself is at this time going through a transition under the influence of a lot of Greek-speaking Syrian Christians. So there's lots of stuff going on all over the world. This may have been a tangent. So let's go back to England and the Age of Bede um, and actually wanted to bring up something since about Anglo-Saxon Christianity and its beauty, which is this book by Sister Benedict of Ward. She is most famous, of course, for her translations of the sayings of the Desert Fathers. She has done two or three different collections, have three or more at least, actually, have been translated by her. But she has also translated the prayers and meditations of St. Anselm and um, has an interest in Anglo-Saxon Christianity as, as well as all of those things. So I thought I would read from this book um, a little bit of a prayer to the Trinity and then a bit of um, theologizing, I guess we would say. Almighty God, Lord and ruler of all, Trinity, Father and the Son, Son in the Father, with the Holy Spirit, forever in all things, existing before all things, Lord, blessed by all forever. I commend my soul into your powerful hands, so that you may watch over it by day and by night, every moment of every hour. And then the little commentary about um, who and what God is. There is only one God who is the base and foundation of all kinds of good. From him they all come and return to him again, and he rules them. Just as all the stars are illuminated and brightened by the sun, some more, some less bright. So too the moon which shines only as brightly as the sun illuminates it. When the sun shines directly upon the moon, then it becomes fully bright. And she has all the references at the back. So the prayer is from the Book of Nunna Minster, and then the last is from the Venerable Bede, Ecclesiastical History of the English People, Book 5, Chapter 21. So, this is a great little book from Cistercian, who is one of my favorite publishers. There's the little C for Cistercian, one of my favorite publishing houses. So, to close the book on Bede for now, here's Beth Bede's Death Song, reading you from the translation by S.A.J. Bradley, Anglo-Saxon Poetry from Every Man, a gift to me from my wife on my 25th birthday. Before the inevitable journey... No man shall grow more discerning of thought than his need is, by contemplating before his going hence what, good or evil, will be adjudged to his soul after his death day. So, there we have it. Bede's death song. And St. Bede the Venerable is our main source for the life and mission of St. Augustine of Canterbury, as I said. He, St. Augustine, was sent by Pope St. Gregory the Great, to convert the English people, he arrived in the year 597. And in fact, Bede's account of St. Augustine was one of the texts that inspired the theme for my breakneck pace run-through of ecclesiastical history last summer, Discipline and Disciple-Making. Bede describes the community of St. Augustine and his companions, and what he describes is a monastic mirror of Acts 4. They are ascetic and they are apostolic. They pray the office, they fast. They preach, they baptize. Personal holiness is at the heart of the success of their mission. Because of St. Gregory's faithfulness in sending St. Augustine, the English people began to accept the Christian faith. The timeline is probably longer than it seems in Bede, but then again, this is what people like to say, that Bede collapses the time to make it seem more spectacular, all of these conversions. But that may not be the case, because there's another thing everyone likes to point out, um, I don't know if to when we try to find the nuances in how God worked in the conversion of the English people. And that other thing is a quieter undercurrent, and its name is Queen Bertha, wife of King Ethelbert. Ethelbert, Ethelbert was a pagan was a pagan, king of Kent. Um, but Bertha was a Frankish princess, herself a Christian with her own royal chaplain. I don't think there's anyone who has a doubt but that Bertha was instrumental in Ethelbert allowing St. Augustine to stay, as well as being instrumental in Ethelbert himself coming to faith. And this is actually a not uncommon thing, that there 
very frequently a king converts after his wife, or there's a mother perhaps, like Constantine and Helena, um, going on in the background. And they are often, they're not always credited with this role at the immediate moment, but eventually people look back and they realize um, that um, the power of God at work um, amongst the faithful means that faithful families, um, as well as faithful missionaries, are bringing people into the kingdom of God. St. Augustine was given the land by King Ethelbert at Canterbury. This is the historical precedent for the primate of all England, being Archbishop of Canterbury and not Bishop of London. And now, here's what the Venerable Bede tells us about St. Aldhelm. In the year of our Lord, 705, Aldfrith, King of Northumbria, died having reigned nearly 20 years. His son Osred, a boy about eight years old, succeeded him and reigned 11 years. At the beginning of his reign, Hede, Bishop of the West Saxons, departed to the heavenly life. He was a good and just man whose life and teaching as a bishop depended more on his innate love of virtue than on what he learned from books. In fact, the Reverend Bishop Pethelm, of whom more will be said in the proper place, who was for a long time deacon and monk with Hede's successor Aldhelm, used to relate that many miracles of healing happened on the spot where Hede died, through the merits of his holiness. He said that the men of that kingdom used to take soil from the place and put it in water for the benefit of the sick, and both sick men and cattle who drank it were or were sprinkled with it were healed. As a result of the constant removal of the sacred soil, a hole of considerable size was made there. So that's about Hede, predecessor of Aldhelm. When Heda died, the bishopric of the kingdom was divided into two dioceses. One was given to Daniel, who governs it to this day. The other to Aldhelm, who presided over it energetically for four years. Both were fully instructed in ecclesiastical matters and in the knowledge of the scriptures. For example, Aldhelm, when he was still priest and abbot of the monastery known as Malmesbury, by order of a synod of his own people, wrote a remarkable book against the British error of celebrating Easter at the wrong time. See, date of Easter, big deal to, like, everybody back then. And of doing many other things to the detriment of the pure practices and the peace of the church. By means of this book, he led many of those Britons who were subject to the West Saxons to adopt the Catholic celebration of the Easter of the Lord. He also wrote a most excellent book on virginity, both in hexameter verse and in prose producing a twofold work after the example of Sedulius. Sedulius wrote an epic poem um, of sacred history focusing particularly on the Passion of Christ. He also wrote several other books where he was a man of wide learning. He had a polished style and, as we have said, was remarkable for his erudition in both ecclesiastical and in general studies. On his death, Fourth Hira became bishop in his place. He also was a man most learned in the scriptures. So that is the story of Aldhelm. He is one of our um, early, ang earliest, one of our earliest Anglo-Saxon theologians. Um, and uh, he also wrote riddles. So Anglo-Saxons love riddles. We all know this. What's it got in its pockets is? String or nothing! So here's one of Aldhelm's riddles. I share with the serf one destiny. In rolling cycles when each month repeats. As beauty in my brilliant form retreats, so too the surges fade in cresting sea. The answer is the moon. Saints Aldhelm and Bede represent the high learning of the English people in the 7th and 8th centuries. Bede died around 735, Aldhelm 709. And so we have amongst the people of the Anglo-Saxons, um, true theologians and true persons of prayer, which really ought to be the same thing. And so this is important. This is the sort of thing that gets me excited because my own religious heritage is in fact the Anglican Church, hence the fact that I own the 1962 Canadian prayer book given to me by my grandfather on my confirmation. And these are the historical foundations of the church in England. Now there are all sorts of important things that happen after Augustine, Aldhelm, and Bede to bring us to um, whatever on earth the, the Anglican heritage is today, but the best and greatest things of the Anglo-Saxons 
are a heritage that I would say any English speaking Christian, whether you're a Baptist, whether you're an Anglican or a Methodist or a Presbyterian, um, any English speaking Christian can um, take these up and, and see them and see that these are the foundational events of our faith and that there is a lot of beauty and truth and goodness to be found in early medieval England. And so people like Bede are worth reading to learn about that, learn about those actual um, foundations of where on earth English speaking Christianity comes from. Um, and he's a, he's a good read. As I say, he's uh, pleasant um, to read. So I would like to just in um, call you forth that you should read yourself some Bede read some bead it rhymes you should also maybe get a book like this this isn't the only such book in the world but it's a nice small one as opposed to some other larger anthologies you could slip it with your prayer book into your bag and take it with you somewhere um anyway so these are just a few thoughts about the history of the medieval church in england and why perhaps we should all be interested in it and appropriate unto ourselves um, its own great riches for our lives and our faith today Hopefully this coming Sunday, I'm going to make another video, another Sunday special. And uh, for now, this is the History of Christianity with Matthew Hoskin. Talk to you later.